This is Nick Black. Today I'm in Paramount Pictures lot and I'm talking to filmmaker Lee Tamahori. It's a pleasure. Do I sound like a New Zealander still or have I become an American? Uh, there's a bit of a twang there. <laughs> That's because I say ass instead of the other word that I'm not allowed to say. You can say whatever you oh, like. Well, I say ass instead of ass. All right, Lee, let's go back to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Firstly, what got you interested in film, basically? Let's start there. What got me interested in film? Hiving off from school and work and going and seeing Sergio Leone movies and any movie that you could see without your adults. There's this great controversy raging in America about unsupervised underage kids going to R-rated movies. John Waters said the other day, he said, show me a kid that hasn't sneaked into an R-rated movie and I'll show you a failure in the making, which I thought was absolutely perfect. Couldn't say it better. That's what I did when my youth sneaked into every movie I wasn't allowed to see and that's how I became a filmmaker. So you take heart kids out there, that's what it's all about. What led you to that theatre? Nothing. I mean, you know, idle youth in every small town goes to the movies because it's fantasy, it's escape, it's the only way out. And this is pre-computer and when we only had comic books. I had Jack Kirby, and then I had Sergio Leone and a few others. After that, I'd start going at a young age. You'd start to realize that good movies were made by the same names that kept coming up in these things called front credits. I was a great fan of, like, action movies and westerns. Uh, I'd start seeing a lot of Sam Peckinpah movies, and I'd start seeing a lot of Roman Polanski movies. When Roman was making, you know, things like Fearless Vampire Killers, and, and especially when he was doing all his early movies in Britain. When once 2001 came along, and Bonnie and Clyde had turned up, and The Wild Bunch was just around the corner, you know, that was it for me because I was a kind of mid-level teenager I suddenly realized that these movies you'd never seen this type of stuff before and in the late 60s I guess it was kind of a blessed time for me because I had seen the last gasp of the American Western and the so-called genre pictures which had become pretty tedious and suddenly you know the Vietnam War and everything revisionist and I was rolling around protest movements and being a kind of long-haired layabout and stuff and having no focus on life going and seeing revisionist film like Leone's I hadn't discovered Fellini or Bergman or anything arty yet I was still a mainstream film goer so when you come across that type of stuff and Don Siegel doing Dirty Harry etc etc it kind of blew my mind but certainly I can point you know it starts really back you know round about effectively 2001 and Bonnie and Clyde kind of rolled around in pretty close focus and I suddenly realized that the film going experience was something quite unheralded so I'd start going to them a lot and that's how I discovered film festivals I thought what's all this about you start to discover all this Eastern European stuff and odd filmmakers from and that's how Tartovsky everything fell into line then Russians everything and so you become I just got a huge appreciation of film from watching movies. After a while, you start going to movies because they were directed by John Huston, yada, 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 yada. So you follow the individuals rather than the hype. You don't have to be too smart to figure that out. Lee, when you were a teenager, there wasn't a New Zealand film industry. Did you have it in your mind to try and emulate your wild-eyed youth? Never in a thousand years. No, all I ever hoped to do was to get a reasonable job to be able to pay me enough money to keep going to the movies. Yeah, there's no film industry whatsoever other than one maverick, legendary filmmaker, our own John O'Shea, who sold on on his own but then we had kind of government institutionalized national film you know much like the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and much like whatever it was in Australia they were doing great movies but no one saw them they were all shorts and they just went on the front of some movie and we spent a lot of taxpayer money on it I had no idea about commercials I didn't even want to become a filmmaker I left to go to live in Australia for four years in the early 70s when I left Melbourne or Sydney both for two and a half years in Sydney you know doing everything taking drugs hanging out getting drunk losing jobs digging ditches doing everything that you're supposed to do when you're 20 or 21 then I got a job as a road manager with a Melbourne-based band called Chain in the uh, early 70s. Uh, that took me to Melbourne for about a year and a half. I had a great time. It was the only time my employers had ever insisted that I kind of drink all night. Right. And uh, you know. By the way, Chain's still going. Are they really? Oh my yeah. God. It's great to hear, really, yeah. because you know those guys were the best. But I was no roadie. I'm too puny, and I couldn't carry upright pianos, and it drove me crazy. But also, it was the lifestyle. You know, driving all night, 6 a.m., you became nocturnal. And I kind of loved it, but the end was in sight for me. I just couldn't. I knew I was never going to survive in that. So I went back to New Zealand in 74, and it was interesting because even as I was going back I remember going to films in Melbourne I was going to the underground what was then the underground circuit in 73, 74 in Melbourne and you were starting to see a lot of odd Paul Cox movies I'm not sure if it was Beresford or it was certainly the Weir and Beresford and the others and Skepsy they were all lurking around that period and I was only just becoming aware of them in the kind of film festival circuit in Australia which was kind of very vibrant still is but I left to go home and by the time I got home it blew up you know and literally the year I went back everybody took off in Australia you know, I mean, the rest is history, film commissions. And of course, then after that, I was kind of like doing my Hemingway-esque 
stuff in New Zealand and chopping down trees and becoming a fisherman and stuff for a year or two. So by the time 1976 rolled around and the Australian Film Commission experience was well cemented, we established our own one. 77 rolled around and we, emulating or copying the Australian example, instituted our first film commission and started making our first movies in 1977, effectively. Sleeping Dogs? Sleeping Dogs wasn't a film commission movie. Strangely enough, Roger Donaldson, who'd made commercials, made it pretty much on his own, got some private venture capital. Couldn't believe it, but I just knew people lurking around the fringes of the industry and I was unemployed, unemployable, I, I think, actually. Nobody, you know, I couldn't get a job anywhere. I was actually on the dole in New Zealand and suddenly, I remember it to this day, someone said, oh, they're looking for guys to go and build sets on this thing for television and I jumped in with a bunch of unemployed labourers from the Labour Department to go and build sets on a huge television and film unit inspired kind of television series. And that's where I met a whole lot of my contemporaries now who were saying, hey, there's this movie being made and it's being funded by the government and all this stuff. So someone said, there's a guy looking for a boom operator, a sound recorder, he's looking for a boom operator, mate, you should go and see him. And I went and saw him and because I thought a boom operator was someone that blew things up, I had no idea. Like all young people, you get around a film set and it's really, it's like amazing. If someone offers you a job in it, you think, hey, I'll pay you to be in it. What was the movie, Lou? It was a film called Skin Deep. It was the first pretty awful film, but we thought it was magic. You know, you go away on location and kind of sleep in a different hotel, motel room every night. It's the great, what do they call it, location experience. You know, it's a game for young men and women, for sure, and not for family men with kids at home. You kind of thought, God, someone's paying me to do this. I think they paid me 80 bucks a week. It was something so pathetic, but I didn't care. I was unemployed. So I became a very good boom operator, and I did every movie that was going, because we only made two a year, so all we could afford. I loved being a boom operator. It was great. What it did teach me, which I had no idea, really, was that it put you in the front line of the technical crew on who's making a movie. I got to see how everything was done. There's only about six people in that position. Everyone else is kind of running around, or they're not always up by the camera. And the boom operator always is. So I got to see how things should be done, how they shouldn't be done. And it suddenly dawned on me that, as a boom operator, I thought, wow, this is the job for me forever. Then I thought, I could see the limitations in boom operating, much as I loved it. I thought, wow, I suddenly thought, no, I'm going to move on. Well, as a boom operator, you're expected to become a sound recorder. But the great thing about New Zealand was, we had no expertise. We had no assistant directors. We had no special effects coordinators. We had nothing. We had to invent everything. So suddenly, Jeff Murphy, who was one of our premier filmmakers, came to me and said, I want you to be the first assistant on this huge movie I'm making. I said, you've got to be kidding. Get out of here. And I said, I'd let you down. and I'm flattered, but no. And then he said, well, you tell me someone I can hire here who's better than you could do, and I'll hire them. And the rest is history. I said, yes. I covered myself by getting a friend of mine who was a very good second assistant, because I said, well, he wants me to be the first. I don't know what to do. I think I know how to run the set, but I had no idea how to schedule a picture. So we did it together. We had a great time, and the rest is history. Which film was this? It was called Utu. And then I was the assistant director on every movie that was being made, because we were still only making two movies a year. But in a very short time, I jumped from Utu to Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, uh, which is Japanese, British, New Zealand co-production. It was my second film as an AD. A major, yeah. major picture. Yeah, and I just literally fell into it, and I guess I did a good job of it. Literally, within a couple of years, I had suddenly become very disenchanted. I did four years as an AD. So now, eight years into the industry, I suddenly saw that I could actually direct as well as some of the idiots I'd worked for. I mean, you get a little arrogant about it. I think you have to be. And I decided that I was going to stop and become a director. And no one would take me seriously. No one would give me a job. But I said, no, you got to stick to this. i got nothing to lose. People like Ian Mune help you out? No, I never really knew those guys very well. I had worked with them, but I'd been an assistant director for Ian. In fact, that was the first time I really got to know him very well. And we've remained very close friends ever since because he'd heard this reputation that I was pretty kind of like tough as an AD. But the producers wanted me to rescue his picture because it was running out of control. It wasn't Ian's fault. But I came in and whipped it into shape and we became the best of friends because of it. I just helped him make a good picture. But no, after that, no one would give me a job, so I started directing TV commercials. A guy called Jeff Dixon, I mean, who's one of our foremost commercial director and has been for 25 years, gave me a job at his company. And I loved it. It was like film school. So I got a really rapid education in filmmaking. In the toughest film school in the world, if you don't perform, you're out. You're gone. 30 second, 60 second storytelling. And strangely enough, once again, I had a lucky break. Most directors of commercials are afraid of actors. They really don't know how to handle them. And they'd rather direct cars or flashy special effects stuff or do stylish art directed commercials. I had spent a lot of time with actors and was very comfortable around them so suddenly I was getting every performance driven commercial that was going, dramatic or even comedic. So I rapidly became the guy that did dramatic. It was me, Tony Williams and Jeff Dixon and that was it. And then I guess in 1991 or something I hadn't had enough of commercials. I still loved doing them but I suddenly realized that after 15 years in this business I wanted to direct a movie and I'd been a very vocal critic of all the extremely boring movies we'd been making under our government assisted program which meant that directors mostly wrote their own scripts, which is a terribly tedious business, and we should avoid it like the plague in New Zealand and Australia. It's our major shortcoming. And everyone hates me saying this, but it's true, because I've now seen, you know, the way it works up here, and you don't need to emulate the American position, but when people write, they write well. That's what they do for a living. Directors do not write good scripts. Some do, but not all of them. And everybody in New Zealand
Zealand merely because they're directing the picture does not mean they write good stories. They usually pluck some story out of the bin about their grandfather and you know, and it's incredibly tedious. And they go and get some money and they've got influence and know how to work the system. Get that film made. No one goes and sees it. It's appalling, dull. And I became so angry with that that I said, look, I'm going to go out on a limb. I want to make a tough urban New Zealand movie because no one's making movies about the New Zealand urban experience. They were making these rural, rustic pictures about sheep and landscape. And I hated that stuff so much, much as I love New Zealand and all that stuff. We're a country full of Maoris and Samoans and, and expatriate Irish Scots and someone's got to be doing this picture. And I didn't know what to do. I was going to write one myself, but it takes time and I'm not a writer and I didn't want to end up as the enemy that I had been accusing. Then suddenly this book came my way and my producer, Robin Scholl, said, do you want to make this movie? And I read it. It's probably the toughest material I've ever read, but I didn't think it would make a good movie. I actually told Robin, I said, it would be a failure. I said, you can't make this into a movie. It's the most violent, nasty, depressing story imaginable. And it was called Once Were Warriors, the book. And I said, no. I said, I can't. I said, Robin, you need to find someone else. But then I started to think, I had a very comfortable life making commercials, making a lot of money, very comfortable lifestyle, thank you very much, with the Range Rover and Land Cruiser and all that stuff. So I said, to hell with this. It's time to go out there and take the biggest risk possible. If you want to make a movie, go out there, put your money where your mouth is. If you think New Zealand films are boring, go out there and do this. And just make the most toughest, most realistic film possible. And being a lover of cinema, not so much being a director of movies, I went right back to what I loved about movies. I said, if you're going to take a tough story like this, don't do it like Ken Loach, much as I love Ken Loach. Merge it with something else. Once a Warriors is a fusion of Don Siegel, Sergio Leone, and Ken Loach, if you look at it. It's Loach's kind of social, but it's cut like a Don Siegel action thriller. So you just tense, you're just ripping the seat rest with your fingernails. It's shot like kind of Italian, like Leone or something like that, which is actually a risk in itself. But I thought, what the hell? Let's go for this thing because kids are going to get raped and drugs are being taken and women are being hit. And the rest is history. I expected it to fail. I expected it to fail miserably. Uh, who financed it, Lee? They've commissioned. Yeah, in a huge battle where half of them never wanted to go near it because of political outfall and the other half who were a lot braver and said, no, no, we've got to make this picture. Fully financed it. Literally, there was a small amount of money from elsewhere. But I literally expected it to fail that I would have done a good job and then I was going to go back to make commercials. And the thing took off. Strangely enough, in Australia, it was more successful in Australia than anywhere in the world. Unbelievable. For some reason. And I had been very critical of Australia for this reason. When Jimmy Blacksmith came out, and I loved that picture, Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, which Fred Skipsey made, it was way ahead of its time, and I'm very aware, having lived in Australia and being close to it and all that, that Australians don't really take to their own movies about black people. It's not a black culture. You know, this is not indictment of Australia, it's just that I know, having lived there, it's a European culture, mostly English and, you know, the whole convict thing I won't go into, but, I mean, all the immigrant structure of Australia is from Europe, and that really a film about black people in Australia doesn't have any connection with people, especially if it's indigenous, and I was sad that Jimmy Blacksmith failed so miserably because it was such a brilliant movie. So I thought that when Once Were Warriors went there, I thought in the 90s, I thought this was still a pervasive thing, but it was astonishing. I think we can handle New Zealand because you're still not the same country. No, but I'd also forgotten how far things had moved on in 10 years. The decade since Jimmy Blacksmith and now in 94 when I'd made Warriors, things had changed so remarkably. In some ways, more the film-going culture was more sophisticated and we're ready to embrace anything. And it was validated, I guess, by the number of people that saw it, certainly Sydney and Melbourne. I was astonished. Well, it was successful and it was one of the most powerful films that I've ever seen. Lee won awards, so what happens? Somebody here in Hollywood sees Once We're Warriors and say, you're the man for us, or how does that work? How did you get here? Well, it's a classic thing, yes, exactly. They take their best and brightest. It's not so much that they've poached the Fred Skepsis and Peter Weirs of the world from you guys, or that they've taken the Lee Tamahoris or Roger Donaldsons from New Zealand. Don McAlpine, great Aussie DP that I love and shot the edge for me, he put it very succinctly. He said, look, when you're offered a chance to play in the big leagues, you're an idiot to turn it down, really. You may as well go and try it. If you don't like it, you can always retreat. That's what we all do. Some of us never come back. It's great to see that now a lot of, certainly the filmmakers I admire the most in Australia are going back there in droves and operate from there. George Miller and Peter and Phil Noyce. Phil Noyce, yeah. And it's good for Phil. His first picture was the best picture he ever made. This $200,000 knockoff in the outback was one of the most amazing Australian pictures I ever saw. Back rows. Back rows. Man, what a picture. I love that. I'm going to go back next year to set up effectively a large scale New Zealand production, but it's still only $10 million US. So that's a huge amount of money for me to make essentially a movie about Maoris in the last century, you know, it's a full-blown action spectacular like a Kurosawa film, but I have always wanted to do this and part of my plan to come up here was to get money to do so. Peter Jackson led the way? Peter, the Peter, no, not really. Peter sort of has led the way, but Peter's a kind of an irascible sort of soul who will not move out of New Zealand. Unlike George Miller and all the others, the Aussies, he wants to make everything in New Zealand. And that's great. I admire him for doing so, but it does hamstring it. You know, some things you can't do by just staying in New Zealand. There's a huge world out there and the resources and the expertise and everything out here is quite astonishing. I'm still happy to make films in New Zealand, but I'd rather bring in a production designer from overseas, for example, rather than use local guys. Much as I admire them, when you can work with these guys who work with the greatest guys in the world, they have some tricks in their bag that, that you really want to employ. Now, the truth of the matter is, I came through
through here with one two warriors on a film festival circuit everyone here in town saw it because it was the hot movie to see and mercifully people just started offering me jobs but I didn't have an agent didn't have anyone I got an agent a very good one still got them to this day and they've been very instrumental in kind of navigating me through this but no one ever does really they ask you what do you want to do and I'll go and find the work for you and I didn't want to do the once were warriors type movies everyone wanted me to do that but I wanted to leave that to American independent filmmakers and I wanted to do large scale American films like McAlpine said let's go for the big league so I did a film called Mulholland Falls which was kind of a retro detective movie but it failed for lots of reasons I think I know what those are now and I won't go into detail you had a great cast had a great cast but it couldn't solve the problem that nobody gives a damn about that genre anymore they really don't even LA Confidential struggled for six months to make any money and it was the best film of that genre since Chinatown so that genre is pretty much nailed into the coffin the western is hard too people go on about Unforgiven but it's pretty much dead there are new genres now and kids growing up that only know science fiction and even the crime film is suffering you know but I love those genres and I'm determined to kind of knock away at them and I did The Edge because it was like a wonderful opportunity to do a David Mamet script who I love with two great actors and it's some, a subject dear to my heart they had no idea how to sell that to the public two guys in bearskins fighting a bear it's just like a nightmare for them to sell it and it didn't make money so now I'm doing a thriller for Paramount you know, it's with Morgan Freeman you know what Morgan does he does these police psychological hunter serial killer profiler type of thing. does he play the same character Kiss the Girls yeah in the same Kiss the Girls he plays this guy called Alex Cross these airport thrillers I call them written by this guy called James Patterson they're very good a lot of people love them this is just another string in that bow and hopefully it'll make some cash and allow me to keep on do you like doing these sorts of I do but I'm not going to make a career out of doing sequels and just genre specific thrillers the game for me is innovative material it always is and I think audiences want that too but it's a dangerous game unless you're in the big leagues and I'm talking about the 50 to 100 million dollar movies you get lost in the cracks I'm in the 30 million dollar range and that's a really dangerous range sounds great back home but it's not it's actually easy to make 10 million dollar movies here or 50 million dollar movies or more the 30 million dollar ones are harder to sell because you don't get Tom Cruise in them they're 30 million dollars because you get guys you can afford for 2 million to 5 million still get Anthony Hopkins yeah they're great but who goes you look at the edge the edge made 33 million at the movies mm. even with Hopkins in it but the general audience there's a great huge massive population here but they don't go and see Anthony Hopkins they go and see Tom Cruise they go and see Brad Pitt they go and see Julia Roberts that's how the system works otherwise they go and see the movie if it's the hot movie to see like Star Wars which had no actors Americans are very good at consuming their own culture and now with the internet and everything else the buzz is so fast on, on a movie I tested this movie I've just made it's called Along Came a Smile I tested it here on the Paramount lot within half an hour there was a review on Ain't It Cool News that was in half an hour someone jumped on a laptop wrote it up and while they were in their car and it was out there so it's fast and it's getting faster all the time and people smell now what is good and what is bad and I don't want to end up just being some sort of hack and of doing kind of like sequels and stuff because it pays the rent I still feel a lot like I did when I made my first movie I still feel like I've got a comfortable lifestyle I'm really in a rarefied airspace of being able to do this stuff I just want to keep pushing the envelope too what else is it all about yeah. what happens here the biggest problem here in America is endings they shoot their scripted endings then they go and change them and then they test them we're not used to that back home they have this sophisticated audience testing procedure which is unfortunate it's basically market research under another name I've just been let down by so many films lately like the last thing I saw was the Albert Brooks movie and with Sharon Stone the ending was shocking yeah well that's what happens they test them and mediocrity wins unfortunately testing doesn't always point the way towards good filmmaking I mean if you tried to test Dr. Strangelove if you could even get Dr. Strangelove made these days and you tested it he'd probably test so badly you wouldn't release it and yet that's what the movie's about everybody knows it including the guys that test movies they all want you to make the greatest movie in the world Chinatown The Godfather Deliverance and everything but they're never sure because there's so much money involved whether it's going to be successful or not the only thing they can hang their hat on is this market research which is incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. because you can focus group this thing to death so alright well we'll have to leave it there thank you very much Lee for taking time to talk with us good luck Lee Tamahori and Lee you've still got your New Zealand veil oh good right and I can uh, yeah I can still I can still muster up an Aussie accent if I want to <laughs> okay thanks